Alright. Let's get started. So, today, uh, nothing you'll ever be tested on. Just for the fun of it, special relativity. And one of the reasons I love doing special relativity is because it shows you that you can start talking about these really complex physical ideas with relatively simple mathematics. And I assume that you've already heard a little bit about Einstein's theory of relativity. Yeah, what do people always say? Time is relative. Yeah, space and time are relative, or at least time is relative. Yeah. And so they have some really terrible notions about what exactly that means. And so we'll lay out exactly what that means. And some people go into this weird pseudo, so nothing's real, and you can't ever be sure of anything because it's all relative, blah, blah, blah. No, we're very sure of what we're talking about in physics. So we'll try to get you to the foundations of why he said that and understand why, even though you and I don't experience time at the same rate, and even though you and I don't agree on how long something is, there's still undisputable things that we do agree about. And it turns out those are kind of irrelevant details. Kind of like arguing about your coordinates. Who cares what coordinates you use? Yeah. All right. So uh, <clears throat> start with the notion that positions and velocities are relative. This is one that we've already stressed a bit, but just to remind you of it. What do we mean by position is relative? There's no absolute position out there. There's no, these are the coordinates that we should always measure from. If I want to say, where exactly is Jeremy? I need to say where Jeremy is relative to something. There aren't these perfect coordinates. So I need to say how far you are from that wall, from that wall, and up from the floor, maybe. And now some people will be tempted to say, no, there are absolute coordinates. We could do it from like uh, the center of the earth. I could do your longitude, your latitude, and your altitude, and then I could always find exactly where Jeremy is. Okay. But imagine that you're talking to some alien somewhere in the universe. And for some reason, you can perfectly communicate through some sort of wormhole, and you're trying to tell that alien exactly where you are. And you say, well, here's my longitude, latitude, and altitude. Well, then you've got to tell them where Earth is. And how do you tell them where Earth is? It's the third planet from the sun. Well, where's the sun? Oh, it's right here in the Milky Way galaxy. Where's the Milky Way galaxy? Mm -hmm. So there's no absolute coordinate system that imposes itself on all of space that we can start talking about positions from. Or there's no preferred place to start talking about positions from. There's no preferred reference frame. And so anytime we talk about positions, we have to talk about positions relative to something. And what is something's position? That's not like some physical property that it has. This is its exact position. It only has a position relative to some other object. So positions are relative. Similarly, velocities are relative. And that one's kind of weird at first, because if I'm walking this way at one meter per second exactly, then to you, my velocity is that way one meter per second. To me, everything's moving backwards at one meter per second, and you're moving that way at one meter per second. And now, which of those is right and which of those is wrong? Right. right. So once again, the temptation is to say, well, obviously, I'm the one really moving. You're the one holding still. Well, you're holding still relative to the surface of the Earth. Because remember, the Earth is also spinning around 1,000 miles per hour. And while the Earth is also spinning around 1,000 miles per hour, it's also going around the Sun super fast. Mm -hmm. And our whole galaxy is orbiting around the center of the Milky Way super fast. Relative to the center of the Milky Way galaxy. So it doesn't make sense to talk about who really is moving and who really is holding still. Or to talk about something's actual velocity. How exactly, what exactly is this object's velocity? That question doesn't really make sense. How fast are you moving right now? You're not. Or relative to the floor, you're not. Relative to the center of the Earth, you're orbiting around the Earth, 1,000 miles per hour. Relative to the center of the Sun, you're spinning around the Earth and you're moving around the Sun. So to talk about your absolute velocity, uh, doesn't make sense. When we talk about your velocity, it has to be relative to something else. One more thought experiment to help keep it perfectly clear in your head. Get rid of everything else. And now it's just you and me floating in space. And from your perspective, I'm slowly drifting this way. And from my perspective, you're slowly drifting that way. 
There is no physical experiment we can perform to determine who's really moving. You see me drifting one way, I see you drifting the other way. Who's really moving? You can't say who's really moving, and so velocities are relative. You can just say I'm moving relative to you, and that you're moving relative to me, and that's all we can say. Okay, so the next big, uh, the next point is reference frames. So what is a reference frame? A reference frame is your coordinates for how you measure the universe. And so you, you typically take your reference frame to be from wherever you are. You mean like the surface of the earth? No, you personally, Jeremy. So in your reference frame, I am moving this way at one meter per second. So we're gonna set up a scenario here. We're gonna assume Let's see, I got my arrow going this way, so I'm actually going to be moving this way. So we're going to assume that for all these scenarios that I'm going to do here for a second, the scenario is going to be I'm on a glass train moving that way. You're at the station just standing there. And so from your perspective, here's what the world looks like. Now, a uh, small point here. Don't get confused by my axes here. So in general, in mathematics, we usually put the x-coordinate here and your t-coordinate here. In physics, they typically do the opposite. So this is your time coordinate. This is your x-coordinate. Okay. Here's me in your reference frame. So this is your reference frame. I'm in my train moving this way. In my glass train, you watch me. This is the instant I pass you. You start your tick watch counting. So we were coming along, the second I pass you, you start a stopwatch, that's how you're going to keep track of time, and you start measuring me with meter sticks and you see that this is how I'm moving. So after this amount of time, I'm right here. After this amount of time, I'm right here. This is my position, this is seconds. Make sense? Yeah. So this is how you see the world. And notice that you, I'll mark this a few times, but it's just kind of understood from here on out, that in your reference frame, you are the t-axis. You're always at x equal to zero. Your position never changes relative to you. You're always home still in your reference frame. Okay. So you and your reference frame are marked by the equation x equals zero, this vertical line. You measure everything from the center of you. Me in your reference frame, I'm moving off, and if I have some velocity v, then the equation for my position is my velocity times my time. Now when I say my velocity, I mean the velocity you see me moving with. You see me moving with velocity v, you see me moving for some amount of time t, then I go some displacement x. Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So hopefully everything in that picture makes perfect sense and you can understand it all. Okay, so now what about my reference frame? What's going on in my reference frame? Now, we're going to do these comparisons of yours and my reference frames a couple times. So, you and I are going to make one agreement about our reference frames. We're going to call that way the positive direction and that way the negative direction in X. That's going to be the agreement you and I have with each other. So, V here actually is just a speed. And then positive v is the velocity that way, and negative v is the velocity that way. So that's the one agreement you and I have about everything here. Well, that's one agreement. The other agreement we have is we're both going to start our clocks ticking the second we pass each other. So I'm moving along to me, you're moving that way. The second that we line up, we both start our stopwatches, and we get synchronized, and we synchronize them. So we're going to also start counting time at the exact same instant. And we're going to start counting from when I pass you or when you pass me. So in my reference frame, here's what's going on. Or in your reference frame, here's what's going on. So if you go back to my reference frame, in my reference frame, I'm always going to use x prime and t prime for my reference frame okay. as my coordinates. I'm always standing at x prime zero for my reference frame. So my reference frame is moving here with me, right? So I'm always at the center of my reference frame. So I'm at x prime equal to zero. You, on the other hand, are moving that way in my reference frame. Mm -hmm. And you are moving that way with the same speed that I am moving this way with in your reference frame. So the only difference is the direction. 
if I'm moving with speed v, or if I'm moving with velocity v in your reference frame, you're moving with velocity negative v in my reference frame. And that's the only real difference. Okay. Good so far? What does that say the same? Oh, yeah. You're right. Okay. So here's your reference frame, here's my reference frame. Now, what we've been interested in since the time of Galileo is can we go back and forth between each other's reference frames? How can I convert between a coordinate in my reference frame and a coordinate in your reference frame? If I know where some object is, if I know that an object is exactly one meter ahead of me in my reference frame, can I figure out where it is in your reference frame? By turning your reference to me. Yeah, by switching back and forth between these coordinates. Is there a way that we can switch back and forth between these coordinates? Probably. And the answer is yes, it's not that hard. How do I get, so how do we get my coordinates from your coordinates? Let's start with that one. Well, notice that in your reference frame, so here's me moving along, and in my reference frame, some object might be some distance ahead of me, right? So here's me and this object moving in your reference frame. At this instance of time, here it is. And we'll say that in my reference frame, I gave this some coordinate x prime. So in other words, it's x prime ahead of me. Mm -hmm. Well, then in your reference frame, when we go to your reference frame, we have all of this distance right here plus this distance. So the coordinate you assign to it, x, is going to be this distance plus this distance. Right? Mm -hmm. So what's this distance right here? That's just my velocity times whatever time we're at. And so you're going to say that the position you assign is going to be vt, the distance I moved, plus the coordinate I assign, x prime. You follow that? X prime being I prime say it's is. this distance because I measure from wherever I am. So I say it's this far. You say, no, I'm going to give it this coordinate. Okay. So you're going to say x prime plus, how, plus velocity times time is the x coordinate you're going to assign. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now I'll solve for x prime, or in other words, move back to the other side, and you get this. Okay. Good so far? Yeah. Pretty straightforward. Now, what about time? If I say, so we start our stopwatches, and they're perfect stopwatches, and we perfectly synchronize them. We're going to assume perfection here. So we will start our stopwatches at the exact instant I pass you. And you say, after some amount of time, it's been two seconds. Over here, how much time will I say it's been? Two seconds. Two seconds. And so to get my time coordinate from your time coordinate, they're the exact same. Yeah. So we have no dispute about the time coordinates. We only change what we're going to call the x coordinate. Okay. And similarly, how do I get your coordinate from my coordinate? I simply add the velocity back on. It's the same equation. So that's how I get your coordinate from my coordinates, and that's how I get your time from my time. So these are called the uh, Galilean transformation laws, or something to that effect. And they're about going from one reference frame to another reference frame, going back and forth. And so now we can use these equations to figure out any reference frame, or any point in any reference frame, if we gave you the velocity. So let's do just one stupid exercise to make sure it's crystal clear uh, what exactly I'm talking about. So let's say I have this object, and after three seconds, it's one meter ahead of me. Mm -hmm. So I say t prime is 3. It's been 3 seconds on my clock. And the object was 1 meter ahead of me. And I say my moving relative to you is 2 meters per second. So we'll say v is equal to 2. Okay. So now our job is to try and find where this marker would be in your reference frame. So it's been 3 seconds since we passed. The marker is 1 meter ahead of me. Here's the coordinates I assigned to the marker. What are the coordinates you assigned to the marker? And so maybe just a 
drawing in the dot really quick here, we're talking about, in my reference ring, one, two, three markers right there, right? Yeah. Okay, so now in your reference ring, what do things look like? Well, we can just kind of blindly use these transformation laws now. Those ones are oh, sorry, these ones. Yeah, get yours from mine. So you're going to assign the x coordinate, it's going to be my x prime coordinate, one, plus my velocity times my time, six, and the t that you're going to assign, t, is going to be the same as my t prime, three. So you're going to be over here, still at three, trying to make it look somewhat similar. And our x was 7. Uh, my slope here is lying, so I'm going to have to change my y-axis, because by the time we get to here, we need to have gone 6, right? Yeah. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So my picture over here is lying a bit. Okay. Feel like you got the intuition down for what these are saying? They're kind of simple equations, it's just easy to get lost in all the x's and x primes and t's and t primes and forget what we're just talking about. Because mm -hmm. it's really nothing complex. Okay, so good intuition for these ways of going back and forth between our reference frames. Pretty straightforward. Maybe, well, we'll come to that one at the very end. Okay, so that's reference frames. That's transferring between reference frames. Now we need to talk about an inertial reference frame. And we've already talked about an inertial reference frame a bit in physics. Do you remember what an inertial reference frame is? Where, the, where it's all constant, right? No. Not you don't remember. Uh, the intuition for what we tell ourselves for what an inertial reference frame is a non-accelerating reference frame. One that's not accelerating is inertial. That's what we tell ourselves as just quick intuition. But if we go back to Newton's first law, so Newton had three laws. His first law was along the lines of there exists some reference frame such that if the net force is zero, the velocity is constant. Some people say it as, an object in motion remains in motion unless acted upon by a net force. Now that's not quite what his first law says. His first law says, there exists a reference frame such that an object in motion remains in motion unless acted upon by a net force. That kind of reference frame we call an inertial reference frame. Okay. So, oftentimes in physics we were dealing with, we tried to always set up our physics problems from some inertial reference frame. Newton's laws, Newton's second law and third law, hold for an inertial reference frame. His second law, F equals MA in an inertial reference frame. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. I don't know if that has to be in an inertial reference frame, but most likely. I'm probably just not thinking about it good enough off the top of my head. So let me give you an example of not an inertial reference frame to make the intuition quick. Imagine that we put you in the back of a bus. You and I are in the back of a bus. All right. Well, you're, you're alone back there. You're in the back of a bus or in a train or something, and you're on a perfectly smooth surface, basically on ice, no friction. You're standing on the bus or on the train. And now the train starts accelerating forward. What's going to happen to you? You get pushed backward. Yeah you'll just start moving backwards in the bus. You'll start moving towards the back of the bus in your reference frame. Yeah. So in my reference frame, if I'm watching you through a glass bus, if it's a glass bus, and you're standing here in a perfectly frictionless way, then after a second, the bus will have moved like this in my reference frame. It'll have moved forward some, and you won't have moved because there was no traction to move you forward. This is for me standing outside watching you. So in my reference frame, which is a non-accelerating reference frame, everything makes sense. You didn't really experience a force, you were just standing there. In your reference frame, you're falling in the reference frame of 
Now let's say that instead of me standing outside of it, now let's say that I was taped to the bus. So now I'm taped to the bus here. So my reference frame is accelerating. And I'm accelerating towards you, right? Mm -hmm. Now what's happening is very different. Now it looks like to me that you're falling towards me. But what force is acting on you? Nothing. Nothing from my reference frame now. So if I'm standing outside the bus and watching, nothing weird's going on, you're not accelerating. You're just holding still. And you won't start accelerating until the back of the bus hits you and starts hauling you forward. And then the bus will be pushing you. But if you put me now taped to the back of the bus here, so that I am now part of the bus and I'm watching you, now you're suddenly accelerating towards me. You weren't moving towards me, now you are, an acceleration occurred, no force. So F does not equal MA in this reference frame. Out here, F does equal MA in this reference frame. So F equals MA, that only holds in inertial reference frames. So in physics, you almost have just base intuition to do this every time, but every time you're solving a physics problem, you always set your coordinate system from some inertial reference frame. Over and over again, you automatically did it. Mm -hmm. And so you didn't really run into this problem. Yeah. But if you tried to do it from the reference frame in the back of the bus, suddenly everything blows up. Because that's not an inertial reference frame. So, that's what an inertial reference frame is. Anytime we talk about physics, we like to talk about it from some inertial reference frame. We talk about the laws of physics from some inertial reference frame. If you're not in an inertial reference frame, then it can seem like the laws of physics are broken. When we're talking about the laws of physics, we're talking about the things that are the same in every inertial reference frame. Now, if I am in an inertial reference frame, and you, being in some other reference frame, are moving at a constant velocity relative to me, then you also have to be in an inertial reference frame. In other words, if I'm not accelerating, and you're moving at a constant velocity relative to me, then you're not accelerating. Yeah. So you're also in an inertial reference frame. So when we set these up, we're going to assume that one observer is in an inertial reference frame, and then since I'm going to be moving at a constant velocity relative to you, I'm also in an inertial reference frame. So they're both going to be inertial reference frames. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Does that have a graph for both of them? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's an inertial reference frame. Okay. What if we were both moving? As long as you are moving at a constant velocity relative to some inertial reference frame, then you are in an inertial reference frame. So you say, what if we both are moving with constant velocity? Is one of us in an inertial reference frame? Yeah. Then the other one automatically is. Because you're moving it with constant velocity relative to me. If I was in the inertial reference frame. If you were the one in the inertial reference frame, I'm moving at constant velocity relative to you. Okay. Therefore, I am. Now you say, well, if we're both moving with constant velocity, it's like you're assuming someone's really holding still, <laughs> and we're both moving in constant velocities in different directions or something like that. Mm -hmm. But there's no such thing as really holding still, so they're just moving at constant velocity relative to you, and at constant velocity relative to me, and we're all just moving at constant velocities relative to each other. If one of us is an inertial reference frame, we all are. How can you test if you're in an inertial reference frame? Uh, forces are behaving as they should. If you're a juggler and you can still juggle, chances are you're an inertial reference frame. Try juggling tape to the back of a van as it's accelerating forward. Yeah. Everything's going to be all screwed up. Or a van that keeps speeding up, slowing down, speeding up, slowing down, and so it keeps jerking you all over the place. It's going to be a lot harder to juggle. So, inertial reference frames are the reference frames that we talk about the laws of physics from. A law of physics is something that holds for every inertial reference frame. That's what a law of physics is. Okay, so now we come to the Michelson-Morley experiment. The Michelson-Morley experiment. So, and the best way to make sense of this is to think about sound for a sec. Now, notice that sound is a wave through the air. And sound always travels through the air at, what is it, 340 meters per second, right? And so, 
How's the best way to say this? Imagine that it was really hard for us to detect whether or not we were actually moving. So you can't really feel air resistance. Let's pretend that you can't feel air resistance for a second. And uh, there's a lot of things that make this sound really weird, but it's the best intuition I can think of. So you're standing on some object, moving. I guess you're blindfolded, so you can't see around you. And so you're moving through the air. The question is, could you figure out how fast you were moving through the air just with sound? Could you and a partner standing on this moving object figure out how fast you were moving through the air just with sound? Like how a bat can we see with sound? Well, here's the idea I'm trying to get at. So imagine that you and a friend you're completely blindfolded, you can't feel air resistance for some reason, are both standing on some object that's moving some direction. We'll say it's moving this way at velocity b. Mm. Well, notice that since sound moves at the same speed no matter what, if I yell, that if I run forward as I yell, that doesn't make my sound waves travel forward faster. Yeah. If I just yell at that wall, or if I am yelling at that wall as I start running forward, the sound still reaches the wall at the same time. Yeah. My running forward doesn't make it any faster. So when you yell this way, your sound wave travels this way at the same speed no matter what. Since as your sound is going this way, and this person's moving this way, since they're traveling towards the sound wave, then the sound's gonna reach them faster. Because mm -hmm. no matter how I'm moving, as long as I start yelling when I'm right here, doesn't matter if I start running that way as I yell or running that way as I yell, the sound's gonna reach that wall at the same time no matter what. But if someone moves forward from that wall, now the sound reaches them sooner. So if I start yelling right here when you're right here, since this is moving this way, then as my sound wave travels towards you, you're gonna come forward a little bit. And so the sound's going to reach you fast. And then if we switch it, and we have you at this end yell at me now, your sound wave is coming this way, but as it's coming, I'm traveling away from the wave. And so it's going to take longer to reach me. Mm -hmm. And so we can determine now how fast we're actually moving based off of the difference in the speed of the sound waves. <laughs> Losing you? you can measure that. If you can measure. Assume we had all the measuring devices we want. The point is it's theoretically possible. Yeah. You see that? We can know how far apart you are. Yeah, we can say we perfectly know, we, we can measure exactly how far apart we are, and we have perfect watches, we have perfect meter sticks. So it is possible for us to figure out how fast we're moving through the air. So the air carries the sound wave. As long as we can measure the sound wave two different directions, we can figure out how fast we're moving through the air. Mm -hmm. Now, prior to 1900, or still at 1900, but around that time. Uh, the big question is light. What on earth is light traveling through? We knew that light was a wave. If you have something waving, you need some medium for the wave to go through. I can't, sound a, I can't send a wave without a medium, right? Mm -hmm. That was the thinking here. And so, uh, we already had from Maxwell's equations, from electricity and magnetism, remember a photon is just an electromagnetic wave. Yeah. So from Maxwell's equations, it says the speed of light is a constant. So the speed of light is some constant c. That came from Maxwell's equations. The same way that the speed of sound in the atmosphere is some constant 340 meters per second. So the idea was, there was this ether. The ether permeates everything in the universe. Everywhere there's ether. And it's waves in the ether, and a photon is a wave in the ether. That's what a photon is. And so this is the reason that the speed of light is a constant. It's just like the speed of sound is a constant in the air. The speed of light in the ether is constant. Okay. So if the speed of light is a constant in the ether, if there's this ether that the speed of light always moves at the same speed through, then we should be able to do something similar here to figure out how fast we're moving through the ether. Assuming we are going through the ether. Huh? 
Assuming there are no atmospheres. Assuming that there is an ether. But if there is an ether, right, this was assuming that there was some atmosphere that we measure sound through. So assuming that there was an ether, that's what the Michelson Worthy experiment roughly did. They measured the speed of light when we were moving with the direction of the Earth and when we were moving against the direction of the Earth. This isn't quite how it works, but it gives you the right idea. So here's the sun. Here's the Earth traveling around the sun, right? Mm -hmm. The Earth is traveling really far this way at this point, or really fast this way at this point, and it's traveling really fast this way at this point. So if this is some ether, assuming that the ether is holding still with respect to the sun, which they didn't think it was, but assuming it was in this picture, okay. then obviously whatever speed we get here, we should get a very different speed here with light coming towards us. Why? Uh, so roughly what we do is we measure, since the earth is going this way really fast, we measure how fast a photon comes at us in this direction. And then when the Earth's going away, we measure how fast a photon comes at us in this direction. Same thing we were doing here. Measure how fast the sound wave comes at us when we're moving towards it, and measure how fast the sound wave comes at us when we're moving away from it. So the light coming from the sun? No, it, this is set up in a lab. It's just doing it at these different times with the Earth, so it's oriented with the Earth this way. So where's the light coming from? It could just be from a laser, the same way that you yelling, you were on the moving object yelling. Okay. So the light source can be on the Earth. The point is, if at this instant the Earth is moving that way super fast, right, and I'm right here and you're right there and I shoot a photon at you and we can measure it precisely, we should get a different speed than if we did it when the Earth was moving this way super fast and I still shot the photon that way. Yeah. That's what it was relying on. Okay. Does that make sense? That's the intuition for what Michelson and Morley were trying to do, Michelson and Morley. And what they discovered is that the speed of light was the same, no matter what. No matter how we were moving, how the Earth was moving around the sun, the speed of light was always a constant. It never sped up or slowed down, which is really weird. That's like the speed of sound. doesn't matter if you're running at me or running away from me, the speed of sound being the same no matter what. No. Sorry. The speed of sound travels through air at the same speed no matter what. If you're running towards me, the sound reaches you quicker. Oh, the other person running at you. Right. So if I were running at you, or you are, if we're running towards each other while yelling, the sound approaches faster. Mm -hmm. I hold still. If you run towards me while I'm yelling, then that first sound wave is going to hit you quicker. Okay, so they found out that there's this weird phenomena that the speed of light is the same no matter what. It doesn't matter if I was moving towards the light source or if I was running away from the light source really, really fast. When I would measure the speed of the photon, it was the exact same every time. The speed of light, C. So, so let's uh, get a picture now for how this is broken in our simple-minded picture here. So we're going to go back to our simple-minded picture here, draw in some photons, and see how weird this is. That the speed of light seems to be measured the same speed no matter what your velocity is. You measure the speed of light the same. Okay. That's what Michelson and Morley discovered. And this was very disturbing when it was first discovered. So once again, we're going to come set up some reference frame here. And we're setting up your reference frame once again. So here's you, you're holding still at x equals zero. Here's me, I'm moving with some velocity, vt, in your reference frame. Now, uh, we are going to, from here on out, choose scales so that the speed of light is always just one. So I'm going to measure the x direction in terms of light seconds and the y direction in terms of seconds. So that the speed of light is just one. And that's because in the equations that we're about to derive here, uh, we don't want to have to keep plugging C's in all over the place. It just makes it messy. Okay. So from here on out, speed of light is 1. Obviously, now I'm moving with an absurdly fast velocity. doesn't matter. But if the speed of light is 1, 
then uh, the position of a photon is equal to its velocity times its time. Position is equal to velocity of the speed of light times time. But if uh, we replace the speed of light with just one, then the equation of a photon is just x equals t. Mm -hmm. So here we are in your reference frame. I'm traveling by in some super fast train, so that I'm not just moving almost the exact same as you. And you also, at the instant I pass you, you're also going to shoot off photons in both directions. Okay. Or I shoot off photons in both directions. Doesn't matter who does the shooting, but as we pass each other, the instant we pass each other, photons also shoot out both ways. So, the instant I pass you, the photons shoot out. One travels that way. There it is. One travels forward. There it is. Here's me. Here's you. Good so far? Yeah. Okay, so now let's use Galileo's transformation equations to figure out what these photons look like in my reference frame. Right? Mm -hmm. So first off, me in my reference frame, getting from me, for me, this is going to be x prime equals zero, right? Yeah. You in my reference frame, if in your reference frame I'm x equals vt, and we agree that that way is positive, that way is negative, in your reference frame, you're going to be x prime equals vt prime, minus, in my reference frame, right? Yeah. Okay, now, what about x equals t in my reference frame? How do we get from, uh, sorry, going from your reference frame to my reference frame? Here's how we get from your reference frame to my reference frame. So in my reference frame, we have this as x prime is equal to whatever it was in your reference frame, t, x equals t. I could have put ct there, but or t, right? I'm just using this equation here, minus vt. Let's leave the speed of light in just for a second. We'll get rid of the speed of light after this. Because I think I might be losing you a little bit with it. So to get my coordinates from your coordinates, you take your x, your x for that photon is ct. So I'm going to say it's ct minus whatever the velocity is, times t. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. And then, we still need to convert the t's to my reference frame. How do we get your t's to my t's? Just replace my t frame. So that's what that photon looks like in my reference frame. Right? So the t's are the same? Yeah, t's and t primes are the same right now. Let me rewrite this a different way, though. This is x prime is equal to parentheses c minus v times t prime, right? And now, this one over here, this is going to be x prime is equal to, we have replacing x, we have negative ct, but then we also have minus v. So maybe you're good with me skipping all the way to c plus v t prime. Yeah. Follow that? Okay. And maybe should have mentioned one more thing about velocities to see why this isn't strange, and then we'll see why it is strange all of a sudden. So, one more thing in my reference frame, ignoring these pictures for a second. Let's say relative to you, I'm moving this way at one meter per second in my train. Now, in my train, I throw this marker forward at one meter per second. So, relative to me, it's going that way one meter per second. How fast is my marker moving relative to you? Two meters, per Two meters per second. You just add the velocities together. Pretty simple, right? Yeah. So, if here's in your reference frame, I drive by. I'm driving by the instant I pass you, you shoot photons in both directions. Sorry, straight out in both directions like that. And I'm traveling this way. The photon that you shot backwards relative to me looks like it's going faster, right? Mm -hmm. And the photon that you shot forward relative to me looks like it's going slower. So here's the forward photon relative to me. 
Here's the backward photon relative to me. And basically, the more horizontal the line is, the faster it is. Remember that we switched our x and our t's here. So horizontal is fast, vertical is slow. So this is faster, this one's slower. Okay. Or just look at the speeds here. Position is equal to velocity times time. Take the speed of light and minus my velocity. And that's what I see here. And then take the speed, add the velocity, and that's how fast I see it going that way. Follow that? Mm -hmm. So, perfectly reasonable picture, right? But the Michelson Morley experiment says no. You and I will measure the exact same speed of light. This is not the way that I will see the universe. How? How? And so I will still see this photon that you shot forward here. I will still see it traveling as x prime equals c t prime. And this photon that you shot backwards, I will still see it as x prime equals minus c t prime. And you and I will have the exact same measurements for how fast that photon is traveling. That's the weirdness of the michelson morley experiment. Everyone was completely surprised by this fact. Makes no sense. Okay. So, so far we were just setting up the scene for what Einstein entered into. This is the problem he came across. That's weird. It is weird. It's very weird. What if you measure the same photon? We are measuring the same photon. We have some tricky way, doesn't matter what the tricky way, of doing this. The point is, even if you and I can precisely measure the exact same photon, and I'm moving backwards and we shoot the photon that way, we measure it as having the exact same speed. Is that just because we can't measure it right? No. This has nothing to do with we can't measure it right. We're assuming we can perfectly measure it correctly. We are saying that in my reference frame, it is exactly traveling the speed of light. And in your reference frame, it is exactly traveling the speed of light. And this is no trick of, oh, we just don't have the technology. This is no. It is that. Period. Is that because there's no ether? which shows that there is no ether. So that's one thing that got thrown out the window. The notion of the ether, we no longer talk about that. No one mentions ether anymore. There is no ether that photons are all traveling at the same rate through. If there is an ether, then it just so happens that the entire e universe is traveling through the ether and the Earth is the only one holding still. That's one possible picture. The other possible picture is there is no ether. So one of those two options has to be true. Either Aristotle was a lot more right than we think, <laughs> or there's no ether. So we got some bad assumptions here. And one of the terrible assumptions that we have, one of the really bad assumptions, is that t equals t prime. That's going to be one that we've got to throw right out the window. t equal to t prime. We've got to be careful with that. That you and I just always agree about time? How on earth do we know that? Because we can measure it. <laughs> so, Einstein says restart. He didn't really know about the uh, michelson morley experiment. He did it just from uh, Maxwell's equations, but... Is michelson morley before Einstein? He, they're, they're contemporaries. So they did this experiment uh, a little bit before he came out with special relativity. But he says he didn't know about their experiment. He was just playing around with the fact that uh, Maxwell's equation says that the speed of light has to be a constant. So the speed of light has to be a constant. The michelson morley experiment verified experimentally that the speed of light has to be a constant. And that the ether never really makes sense. If he didn't really buy into the concept of an ether to begin with, then... There's no reason that he had to know about this experiment, but it has a better narrative if you point out the experiment. So, mm -hmm. that's the narrative. Anyways, so Einstein says, we're going to restart. 
We're going to restart, drive everything from the beginning. We're not going to go crazy making all these assumptions just because they appeal to our intuition. And we're going to start with just two postulates. Postulate number one, Galileo's principle of relativity basically comes down to the laws of physics are the same in every inertial reference frame. There's no preferred reference frame. The laws of physics are the same in every inertial reference frame. Pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. Postulate number two, the speed of light is a constant. We'll call it C. The speed of light is a constant is a law of physics. Or in other words, the speed of light is a constant in every inertial reference frame. So in this reference frame and this reference frame, the speed of light has to be a constant. These are the only two things that we're going to assume and we're going to see where they take us. Okay. You see the restart we're doing here? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the first uh, concept Einstein then had to take on uh, was a concept of synchronous. The concept of two things happening at the same time. How do we define what it means to be synchronous? How do you know that two events actually happen at the same time? Because started to measure at the same time. What do you mean, though? If I were to drop these two markers and I say, I want you to tell me if they hit the floor at the same time, and then you watch, how do you know if they hit the floor at the same time? Because one of them hit the floor before the other, so it's not. You do it based off of which one you, if you see them at the same time, then they happened at the same time. That's roughly how you gauge it, right? Yeah. Now, this almost works. Well, I don't know about that. So, uh, from here on out, we're going to think about an event as a, like a flash cube going off. So, that's what we'll mean by an event from here on out. Two flashes going off. That's a good way to think about an event. And how can we tell if two flashes going off happen at the exact same time? Now, if I have them close to you, and you see them at the same time, then there's a pretty good chance, then there's a good chance that those happen at the exact same time. But now let's say I have a flash cube go off right next to you, and I have another flash cube go off a light year away from you, and you see them at the same time. Did they happen at the same time? No, because the other one's farther away. Because the other one's farther away. All right, so now you're getting to what Einstein says we need to say means happen at the same time, or what he means by synchronous events. So, in your reference frame, so we're going to have three people in your reference frame. Here's someone, here's you, here's someone else. I don't know, here's Bob, here's Frank. And you guys measure out in your reference frame using your meter sticks. So that you are in the exact middle of Bob and Frank. Okay. You with me? Now, Bob and Frank both have flash cubes go off. And the question is, in your reference frame, did those flash cubes go off at the same time? And the way that we gauge that is, so Frank has his flash cube goes off. He was aimed that way, so a photon travels from here. And Bob has his go off. His goes like that. And if both those photons reach you at the same instant, then we said those were synchronous events. And that's what you mean by the same time in your reference frame. Okay. If some middle observer observes both events at the same instant, then those events happened at the same time, or were synchronous events. If it's in the very middle. If some middle observer okay. observes both events at the same instant, then those events are said to be synchronous or to have happened at the same time. That is what it means in your reference frame for two things to happen at the same time. Now we're going to get really weird with it. Because <clears throat> I and everyone in my train, so we have, we're going to have you sitting here, Bob sitting here, Frank sitting here, and then I'm going to get with Bill and Sally, and they're going to be on either side of me, and we're going to be in our train traveling past you guys. And at the instant, so we're traveling like this. Here's a, I can't remember who I said. 
Hillary Stone. This is Phil. Me, I may have passed you. And we're all going to be at the same slant because we're all traveling with the same speed. I'm trying to make it look that way. And here's Sally. And notice that I'm also directly in the middle of Phil and Sally in our reference frame, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're going to say that as Phil, me, and Sally all pass by you guys, the instant Phil passes Bob and Sally passes Frank, Then they're going to light those cubes off. So they're going to flash the cubes together. They're both going to press it. So in your reference frame, it's like Bob and Frank made the event occur. In my reference frame, it's like Phil and Sally made the event occur. Made the event occur. Uh, Triggered the event. Made the flash cube go off. In, in other words, Bob and Sally were uh, Bob and Phil were occupying the exact same position when the light cube went off. Right. Frank and Sally were occupying the same position when this light cube went off. Yeah. I am going to pass by you. Okay. When you say, when you're going to say those events went off, and then time goes forward. And the question is now, in our reference frame, were those events synchronous? Or is it the case that in our reference frame, one looked like it was ahead of the other? And that's exactly what it's going to look like here. Notice that for me, if I'm sliding like this in your reference frame, then that photon is going to reach me a little earlier than it reaches you. And this photon back here is going to reach me later. And it's going to hit me right there. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to say, no, those were not synchronous events. Because from my perspective, I was a middle observer to two people in my reference frame. Two events triggered, their light didn't reach me at the same time, therefore they weren't synchronous. In your reference frame, you say, yes, they were synchronous. I was a middle observer, two people equidistant from me triggered events at the same time, the photons reached me at the same time, so they were synchronous. Is that how it would work though? The speed of light is a constant. The speed of light is a constant, and so from my reference frame, this one was actually shot later than this one. I disagree about when they were shot. From my reference frame, I'm saying, you're lying. Bob shot his photon a little bit later than Frank. From your reference frame, you're saying, no, no, no. Those happened at the exact same time. Okay. And so, what is the present for you isn't necessarily the present for me. What you call synchronous events isn't necessarily what I call synchronous events. This event that Bob triggered over here, by the time it's the present for you, it's still in the past for me. That event hasn't reached me yet. Okay. I don't know about that event yet. I haven't experienced that light yet. You have. And so we can't necessarily agree about the order of events. Three events that, two events that to you seem like they happened at the exact same time. To me, it looked like one happened than the other. Can't you measure it and find out that they were the same? Like track where it hit you, how long it took, and what the velocity was? Well, how we talk about distances so far, uh, we got to be careful. So, so far, we've, we've been doing all the measurement from your reference frame. Everything right here in this picture is happening from your reference frame. So, in your reference frame, at the instant Bob passed Phil, or Phil passed Bob, he shot photon. At the instant Sally passed Frank, he shot photon. At the instant I passed you, is what you agree would have been when those were shot. And then here's how things evolve in your reference frame, how you see things happen, mm -hmm. right? And so for my reference frame, since I'm the middle observer of these two, then the two events here are not happening at the same time in my reference frame. I will not agree that those happen at the same time because I'm still a middle observer in my reference frame. Mm -hmm. So that's the big, uh, so that's how we define synchronous events, and this throws out this notion of everyone can just agree on absolute time. That everyone can agree that at this time, here's what really happened. There's no way for us to agree about that. 
Your reference frame cannot be preferred to my reference frame. And in my reference frame, they're not the same. In your reference frame, they are the same. All you can conclu conclude is synchronous events, that's relative. What is and is not synchronous events, that's relative. Depends on your reference frame. And it changes for different reference frames. With me so far? Yeah. All right. So now you got the idea for uh, synchronous error. We're ready to draw the picture that's going to be a law of algebra. It's just a couple intersections, but basically, let's try and figure out now what I do call synchronous events compared to what you call synchronous events. That's what we're going to figure out now. So you probably have enough space here to fit it. So redraw out this picture. Uh, try and not get too crazy with it. So once again, this is your reference frame. Call that point O for the origin. We'll have me traveling, try not make it too steep. And so in your reference frame, okay, so from here on out, we're going to do C equal to 1. Otherwise, the algebra gets messy. Mm -hmm. So here I am traveling in your reference frame. And I'm traveling, uh, you're going to say x is equal to b t. Here's time, here's our position. So I don't get very far in a long time. And then in your reference frame, someone's going to be exactly one meter ahead of me measured with your meter sticks. Uh, let me see the picture here to see if I need more space to help make sense of everything. Maybe space these out more. Help make it cleaner. So one meter in your reference frame, try and draw it half decent. So in your reference frame, this is x equals vt plus one. This person stays one meter ahead of me using your meter sticks. And then finally, one more person. X equals BT plus two. Okay? Mm -hmm. And now, uh, a photon in your reference frame. Maybe we'll do the photon in orange. Photon in your reference frame travels straight over at a 45 degree angle. Because the photon is just x equals t, because we're going to replace c with 1. OK, so photon in your reference frame just looks like this. And that's when it's going to reach that observer right there. And it's going to keep going. Whatever, this is x equals t for our photon there, right? Yeah. And now we're going to kind of uh, work it backwards. A photon that was shot from here, shot this way. This was another photon. We'll worry about the equation on this line here in a second. But another photon is shot backwards. And notice that since these two photons reach the middle observer at the same time, then in the moving reference frame, these two events happened at the same time. Good? Okay, that's what we're after here. So now let's start labeling some points and let's figure out what that is. So this is a point we're gonna call this point A. And this point right here, we're gonna call this point B. Once we figure out the coordinates of point B, we can find the line from O to B. And that tells me in your reference frame what I call time equal to zero. I call synchronous events. Because notice from your reference frame, all these events right here on the horizontal line are synchronous. That's what we mean by setting up your time scale this way. Right? Yeah. So we're basically trying to figure out, in my moving reference frame, what do I call t prime equal to zero? Because this line right here is what you call t equal to zero. This line is t equal to zero. Time equal to zero is this line. If we find the corresponding part for my t prime equals to zero, that's going to be the line that goes through here. And that's what we're interested in. Here's my x prime equal to zero. 
This is going to be my t prime equal to zero. Your x prime? This one right here. Here's me. So this is x prime equals zero. Or x equals vt. Let's make that shorter so that we can uh, see that. Make sure it's quarter. This is x prime equals zero. All right. So sorry, I set the picture weird here. We're switching it so that me and you started at this side. So you're right here. Here's Bob. So Bob's gonna be in the middle, and then this is me, and Phil's over here. So that way, wherever you are is what you're going to call x equal to 0, which is this line. I call wherever I am x prime equal to 0, which is this line. You call t equal to 0, whatever, synch whatever events are synchronous with when you start your stopwatch. And I'm going to call t equal to 0, whatever synchronous with when I pass you. Which is going to be this point. It's going to be synchronous with this point. Okay. With me? Okay, so from here on out, as hard as the concepts are that we're talking about, the algebra is just simple algebra. So from here on out, we're just going to do some algebra really quick. Let me move that in some so that we have space over there. So this is what you call t equals 0, or in other words, the x-axis. Okay. So first, I'm going to find the coordinates of A in your reference frame. Okay. So, uh, this is the line x equals to t. This is the line x equals vt plus 1. So I'm just solving a system of linear equations. So I have x is equal to vt plus 1 and I have x is equal to t, and I'm looking for where those intersect. Okay. Right? Yeah. Okay. So if x is equal to t, I can replace t up in this equation, x in that equation with t. So combining this with this, I can rewrite it as t is equal to vt plus 1. Mm -hmm. Move the vt over here. Uh, is that the way I want to do it? I don't know, that matters. Yeah, we'll move the vt over here. So I get t minus vt is equal to 1. Factor it out, I get t times 1 minus v is equal to 1. Or I get t is equal to 1 over 1 minus v. That's time. So that's the time coordinate that you assigned to this. Mm -hmm. What's the x coordinate that you assigned to it? You can just use this vt plus 1. You could, or you could just remember on this whole line, x equals t. Yeah. Right. So x is also equal to 1 over 1 minus v. With me? Oh, yeah. So those are the coordinates at that point. I'm going to go write them over here, and we'll just keep doing scratch work over there. We'll just write our conclusions over here. So we found the x-coordinate at A is equal to 1 over 1 minus V, and we found that the t-coordinate at A is equal to 1 over 1 minus V. Good so far? Yeah. All right. So now, uh, <coughs> we need to find the equation of this orange line right here. The B? Not the B, this orange line right here. So the end of We need to find the equation of that orange line, and then I can find out where the orange line crosses this line, and we're done. Okay. So remember that that orange line is a photon moving that way. Right? Mm -hmm. So its velocity that way is negative 1. Mm -hmm. Or in other words, its slope is negative 1. I know the slope of this thing is negative 1, I just don't know where it crosses this axis up here. Is this the velocity of A also? A is just a point. It's not a velocity. I mean, this velocity of this line yeah. is 1. 
It's x is equal to 1 times t. So doesn't that make both your equations you can't use? Because it would be undefined? It would be undefined. 1 minus the velocity is less than 1. Oh, no. V, sorry. V here is not the velocity of the photon. The velocity of the photon is 1 in our picture. The V here is the speed that us three are moving with. I'm traveling with velocity V. V is my speed. One is the speed of a photon. So my speed, if it's slow compared to a photon, is like 0.01, is what V is. If I was traveling at 1% the speed of light. Okay. And it's the top velocity. Yeah, it's the velocity of these three lines. They're all moving with V. Okay. Good. Okay, so the velocity of this photon here is 1 for the speed of light. Mm -hmm. We're just setting up with units so left. The speed of light is 1. This photon here is traveling with speed negative 1. It's a photon moving that way at the speed of light. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the equation of this line, I know its slope of this line, and I know a point that it goes through. So exactly, so just to write it out in case... You're not 100% clear on it. There's a point slope form for a line. Now, for our special case, we're talking about this line right here. I know that y minus a y coordinate, which is 1 over 1 minus v, is equal to m, the slope of our line is negative 1, times x minus our x coordinate. You with me? Except I used y when I should have used t. Okay. Now everything makes sense, right? Yeah. All right. So, um, the equation of this line then, if we get it in terms of t, we're going to have t is equal to, we have negative x, when I move this to the other side, so first off, we have positive 1 over 1 minus v. If I move this to the other side, then we're going to have plus 2 over 1 minus v. You follow that? Yeah. Last thing I'm going to do, I'm going to put t and x on the same side. So t plus x is equal to 2 over 1 minus v. Okay, there's the equation of this line. So what we're looking for are the coordinates of v. I know the equation of this line. Now I need, the, I need to find where that intersects this line. So I've got, here's that line. We also have this line, which is uh, x is equal to vt plus 2, right? Mm -hmm. So just uh, set that up, substitute probably this in for x up there, and solve for t, right? So substituting this into this, maybe draw a line there. That was just coming up with this equation. So now we're solving these two equations. So substituting in, we get t plus vt plus 2 is equal to 2 over 1 minus v. Right? And what you do with that? I substituted in that x with this. Okay. That's all I did. Yeah. And then we're just going to solve for t. So move the 2 to the other side, and over here, factor t out these two terms. So we factor t out those two terms, we get 1 plus v is equal to, I'm going to move that t to the other side. So we get 2 over 1 minus v plus 2, and I'm going to multiply 2 by 1 minus v over 1 minus v. So we get a common denominator for this 2. All that is a minus. Minus 2 over here, and then multiply top and bottom by 1 minus v, so we can get a common denominator over there. Okay, so then we have t times 1 plus v is equal to, when we get our common denominator here, we're going to get, we have 2 here, we're going to get negative 2, and then we're going to get plus 2v in the numerator. So we're going to get 2v all over 1 minus v, because they have a common denominator, right? Mm -hmm. And so finally then we get t is equal to, divide both sides by 1 plus v, and 1 plus v times 1 minus v is? v squared. 
1 minus v squared, so we get 2v over 1 minus v squared, and there's our t coordinate. So that's the t coordinate at b. Mm -hmm. So maybe we'll come plug that in really quick. t coordinate at b, we just barely found, is 2v over 1 minus v squared. Now we need to find the x coordinate at b. We have t now. Uh, so let's plug that in and figure out what x is. Uh, where, which one would be easier to plug into? I'll plug into this one. With me? Mm -hmm. So rewriting this equation, I'm going to have x plus t, which is that, is equal to 2 over 1 minus v. So that was substituting t back into this equation. Right? Yeah. And now, we're just going to solve for x. So move this to the other side, get a common denominator, add the terms together. So x is equal to 2 over 1 minus v minus 2v over 1 minus v squared. To make this one's denominator the same as that one's denominator, I need to multiply this term top and bottom by 1 plus v. Did I do something wrong? Don't you need to multiply the 1 by v as well? Or the 1 minus v, 1 minus v squared? So far, I just moved it over. I haven't gotten a common denominator yet. Oh. I just put this to the other side. Oh. Now I'm going to take this term, which is now right there, and multiply it top and bottom by 1 plus v. Yeah. OK. So now we get x is equal to. We're going to have 2 plus 2v minus 2v is going to leave me 2 in the numerator. And in the denominator, we have 1 plus v times 1 minus v is the same thing as 1 minus v squared. Mm -hmm. Follow that? So that was our x coordinate at b. So our x coordinate at b then is equal to 2 over 1 minus v squared. Yeah. Okay, so now that we have the coordinates there, we're ready to find the equation of the line that travels from O to B. Right? Okay. And so the equation of that line, we know it goes through the origin here. So... T is equal to mx plus b, right? Because t yeah. replaces our y. So y is equal to mx plus b, or t is equal to mx plus b. So what's our slope now? Rise over run. What's this divided by this? Just v, right? Just v. Yeah. Perfect. So mx plus b, our y-intercept is 0 for that line. So t equals bx. T being the, the time you assign to this on this line, the equation of this line in your reference frame is t equals bx. You could rewrite that if you want it in terms of x. You could write that as x is equal to 1 over bt. That's fine too. But this is the equation of this line in your reference frame. And notice that this is what I call t prime equal to zero. That's what I call synchronous events. Uh, sorry, but what does v and x supposed to do? Velocity and position. V velocity is velocity. Position. X is how far you've gone. T is time. Okay. So the scenario we have set up here is it's me and two of my friends are all in a train traveling this way, glass train so you can see us, traveling this way at the same velocity v. So we're all traveling together in your guys' reference frame. Yeah. And in your reference frame, my first friend is one meter ahead of me, and my second friend is two meters ahead of me. So here was the equations for each of us. In your reference frame, I'm at x equals vt. My friend is at x equals vt plus 1. My other friend is at x equals vt plus 2. Okay. 
We've set up our reference frame so that T, here we're measuring seconds, here we're measuring light seconds. Light seconds. Light seconds. The distance light goes in one second. Okay. So in other words, basically using the same units here. We set it up there so that a photon, those orange lines are photons, photons which travel at the speed of light then have a speed of one. Oh, that makes sense. So it's just like we don't have to have any C's in our equations. Okay. Because for a photon, you always know that your position is equal to your velocity times your time. For a photon, we replace the velocity with the speed of light, but over here we set up a scenario where the speed of light is just one. Okay. So x equals t, that's a photon going this way. And then the equation of this line, I can't remember what it was, but it has a slope of negative 1, because it's a photon traveling that way. So all photons traveling that way have a slope of 1. All photons traveling this way have a slope of negative 1. So what are you trying to show? So we were trying to figure out what, in my reference frame, in the moving reference frame, we call synchronous events. What we call the same time. So in your reference frame, you're saying this point and this point and this point, these events are the same time. They're all at t equal to zero. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Similarly, take any horizontal line here, you say all these events are at the same time. Any horizontal line for you would represent the same time. What in my reference frame is the same time? Is what we were looking for. Isn't that going to be in Phil's reference frame? In mine, in Phil's, and in Sal Salad's. We're all in the same reference frame. We're all traveling at the same velocity, and they've all agreed that we're going to use wherever I am as zero. Okay. Because in your reference frame, in the reference frame of this classroom, we can call any point zero, and it doesn't change anything. Any point we're going to count from zero, our origin. So as long as everyone's traveling with the same velocity, they can be in the same reference frame. So, so Phil, Sally, and me are all in the same reference frame. I mean, you, you guys are all in the same reference frame. When you say t prime is equal to zero, that's in your reference frame or my reference frame? Well, in your reference frame, it's t equals vx. That's the equation of this line. Yeah. And now you know that t equals vx has to correspond to t prime equals zero. Because this is what I call synchronous events. A middle observer got both those photons at the same time. Mm -hmm. So t prime is... The other person's. T prime is what I call time zero. Here are all the events I call time zero. Here are all the events you call time zero. Mm -hmm. Here are all the positions you call zero. Here are all the positions I call zero. Yeah. And notice the symmetry there. What you call x equals vt, I call x prime equals to zero. You say I move in this way and that my position can be mapped out by x equals vt. I say, in my reference frame, no, I'm not moving. This is zero. I'm holding still. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. In your reference frame, you say, these events right here all happen at the same time. In my reference frame, I say, no, no, no. These happen at the same time. Yeah. Okay. Which is not the same thing as what you call the same time. We did the picture for what you call the same time down here. Maybe we can go over that one more time. What does it mean to say that two events happened at the same time? Yeah, what does that mean? What does that mean? How can you tell if I drop two objects that they hit the ground at the same time? That, that just means they both hit the ground at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> tell me if these both hit the table at the same time. They don't. How did you know? Because one fell before the other. Because you saw one hit the ground before the other. Yeah. So if you see them hit the ground at the same time, then you might say they happened at the same time, right? Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so imagine now I have two flash cubes, and I flash both the cubes, and you see the flash hit you at the same time. Did I flash them at the same time? I would assume so. You'd assume so. Let's try one more. Let's say I've got one flash cube here, and another flash cube a light year away. And I flash both those cubes at the same time. Do you see them at the same time? No. So how would you know if they were synchronous events? Yeah, how would you find that out? So we say that two events are synchronous if some middle observer 
sees them at the same instant. So if I'm in the exact middle of you and Jeremy, and you guys both like flash cubes, and those light cubes hit me at the exact same instant, then I'd say that was a synchronous event. You guys shot those flash cubes at the same time. If I'm in the exact middle of you guys. Isn't that relative though? Is it what relative? Relative to the middleman. Like what if there wasn't a middleman? Well, whether there was or there wasn't, you'd say two events happen at the same time if photons from those events reach some middle point at the same instant. You can all agree about what a middle point is in a reference frame. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that mean all events eventually have photons that hit each other? Like a sun light years away and a sun light years away will eventually have photons hit each other? They could. I mean, you see stars shining. Yeah. Those are suns forever away. Their photons are hitting you. That's why you see them. Okay. Those are photons that they shot light years or several years in the past, depending on how far away they are. Can if it's a million light years away, then that's a light from a million years ago. You're seeing the star how it looked a million years ago. You're not seeing how it currently looks. Because the light takes time to travel to you. Yeah. Can you give me an example of a non-synchronous uh, event? Those did not hit the ground at the same time in your reference frame. In my reference frame, but in someone else's it might have. Maybe, maybe not. So it is relative depending on the person. It's relative to the reference frame. Oh, I see. Okay. So, in your guys' reference frame, here's me and two of my friends traveling past you and two of your friends. Okay. You and two of your friends, so Bob's in the middle of you and another friend, me and my two friends, so you guys are lined up one, two, three, and I have me and two of my friends lined up one, two, three, and the instant we pass you in your reference frame, you shoot off a light bulb, you flash a light cube, Frank flashes a light cube. Bob, you guys already measured ahead of time, you know that Bob's exactly in the middle of you and Frank. Okay. The photon from the cube that you shot and the photon from the cube that Frank shot reaches Bob at the exact same instant. You with me? Okay, that makes sense. So Bob saw those at the exact same instant, therefore in your reference frame, you and Frank shot those cubes at the exact same time. Those were synchronous events. They happened at the same time. In your reference frame. In your reference frame. Gotcha. For me, Phil, and Sally here, who are just traveling past, as I pass you, you shot the cube. As Sally passed Frank in your reference frame, well, as Sally passed Frank, we can say that still, Frank shot the cube. And here's Phil, and he's traveling past Bob. Phil is in the exact middle of me and Sally. In our reference frame now. Yet, he experiences them at different times, right? Yeah, so Phil here, since he's traveling this way, it takes this photon a little bit longer to reach him, and the photon from Frank reaches him a little bit sooner. <laughs> and so Phil will say, no, 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 Frank flashed his cube before you did. Bob says, you guys flashed them at the same time. Phil says, no, you didn't. Wow. Who's right? No, neither is right. Neither is right. Both of them were middle observers, witnessing events in their reference frame. The difference is what you and I call synchronous events aren't the same thing. A synchronous e event in your reference frame was not necessarily a synchronous event in my reference frame. So we just barely found what would be a synchronous event in my reference frame. So a photon being shot here and a photon being shot here in my reference frame, those would be synchronous events. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see that. So this right here, the equation of this line, is what I call time equals zero. And you call it time equal vx. The equation of this line in your reference frame is t equals vx. In my reference frame, if we redraw this picture of my reference frame, this would be t prime equals zero. That's kind of cool. So maybe we'll just try, uh, I might skirt the picture a little bit, but let me just try roughly redrawing this picture. I won't get all the details on there but redrawing this picture of my reference frame to help cement in the intuition. Okay. 
So same picture here, but now my reference frame. So in my reference frame, what's going on? Here's me. Here's my first friend. Here's my second friend. So this right here is x prime equals zero for my t prime axis. I don't know which one you like more. Like the variable that I put t prime there or the equation there. Over here is x prime, my x prime axis, or in other words, my t prime equals zero axis. Same thing. Okay? This is everywhere where t prime is equal to zero. In my reference range, what happens between here and here if we draw those two events? That just looks like this. Here is point A to me. Here's point B in my coordinates. Where are you in my coordinates? You and my coordinates are drifting this way some. So you're moving like this in my coordinates. So you're over here at x prime equals minus bt prime, right? Mm -hmm. And what you call synchronous events is right here. So this is what you call t equal to zero, which for me is going to be t prime equal to minus v x prime. Gotcha. Can you do that? Can you like stretch out the graph? <laughs> we have no notions of Euclidean geometry yet. And I'm telling you right now, Euclidean geometry does not work. The geometry you need to use for uh, special relativity is called hyperbolic geometry. So be careful. Hyperbolic geometry? Yes. Okay. Here, let's make things bigger on both sides. But this is what should carry over. This angle should be identical to this angle, and this angle should be identical to this angle. That much should be preserved. But the angle in between will be Anything else in between, well, and the other thing that should be preserved is a photon here should be 45 degrees, a photon here should be 45 degrees, and this one should be minus 45 degrees, or 45 degrees up like that, and that should be 45 degrees up like that. Shouldn't there be 45 degrees on the other side too? No, it should be nice. You're saying right here? Yeah, right there, and then on the other side. Yeah, right here is 45, and right here is 45. This one for you is 45. This one for me is 45. 45 from here to my zero, not to yours. So they're not the same. And you can't just take this and tweak it a little bit to get this thing over here. It's weird. It's like you took this and you like stretched it somehow, but you stretched it in a weird way that preserved some things. And in other words, it preserved the speed of light always being at 45. You with me? Okay. So, this was just to try and help give you intuition. Let's stay focused on this picture. How things look from your reference frame. I think that helps. Now, ultimately, what we're after, sorry, I didn't stress this enough. Ultimately, what we're after is transformation equations. What we really want is to know how to take any point in your reference frame and find its corresponding coordinates in my reference frame. Same thing we started out doing over here. So Galileo's transformation, when we were nice and simple-minded, and the transformations we've been using for all the physics up till now, were just these transformations. Mm -hmm. Any x-coordinate in my frame is the same as the x-coordinate in your frame minus my speed times my time. Or any x-coordinate in your frame is the same as the x-coordinate in my frame my frame plus my speed times my time and we assume that whenever we talk about time we were talking about time and time is time and who could ever argue about time there's just absolute universal time yeah no why that's what we huh why isn't it well we'll see what time is we'll make conversions between them but so far we assume that we could just use these simple transformations we found out those simple transformations lead to a broken world. Oh. 
the broken world is this broken world. All right, here's the crazy thing. Maybe some more of the experiment. Speed of light is always a constant, period. End of discussion. Speed of light is always a constant. It doesn't matter what your reference frame is. If you measure a photon, it's a constant. Here's the crazy thing. You're holding still. I'm traveling this way at one meter per second in your reference frame. In my reference frame, I take this marker and I throw it one meter per second. How far does my marker move? How fast is my marker going in your reference frame? Two meters. Two meters per second. Pretty straightforward, right? Now let's say I'm in a super fast train and I'm traveling at half the speed of light. And while I'm traveling at half the speed of light, I turn on a flashlight and so I shoot a photon. And so relative to me, the photon travels at the speed of light. How fast does the photon travel relative to you? Speed of one and a half times the speed of light, right? Yeah. No, it's just the speed of light. Yeah. How does that work, though? It is an observable fact of the universe. So when you It's not something we derive. Well, you can get this conclusion from Maxwell's equations. Maxwell's equations say the speed of light is a constant. Maybe some more of the experiment is going out there trying to measure the speed of light and saying, well, what if I'm going this way versus this way? What's the difference in how we measure the speed of light? Came out the same no matter how crazy they were moving. So that's where Einstein restarted. Two postulates. One, the laws of physics are the same in every inertial reference frame. Two, the speed of light is a constant is a law of physics. In other words, the speed of light being that constant, that's the same in every inertial reference frame. So whatever the speed of light is for me, that's what it is for you, as long as we're both in inertial reference frames. So if I'm moving at a constant velocity relative to you this way, you and I are measuring the same speed of light. Yeah, but what about your example? Doesn't that just break it? No, that means we're using bad assumptions in the example. Oh, bad assumptions. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so we've got to be very, very careful about exactly what we mean by different things. And so one that we've stressed a bit now is what we mean by the same time. Most people just assume there's this absolute thing, thing called time and everyone can just agree on the same time. We should show the example, no, we can't agree about what the same time means. So I can say that there's just this universal clock ticking away that we can all make reference to. But there isn't. There's not. Time is relative? Yes. Oh, time yeah, is relative. we went over that. And space is relative. Yep, <laughs> yep that's what we're finding out. So synchronous events so far, we, call, we found out that's relative. So you can't say everything, in, you can't say these two things happen at the exact same time. You can only say that they happen at the same time in your reference frame. Because what's the same time to you isn't necessarily the same time to me. Yeah. And this was a simple example to show it. Okay. So over here we were looking at what you call time equals zero is this line. What do I call time equals zero in your reference frame? What events do I call time equals zero? These events, I say, happen at the same time. In your reference frame, this event happens before this event, right? It's lower down. Yeah. In my reference frame, no, they happen at the same time. We don't agree about what the same time is. We disagree. I'm going to put the coordinates of these up here. So we found the coordinates of A is 1 over 1 minus B. I don't know if we'll need that one. I don't know if we'll need any of this anymore, actually. Okay, we have those in case we need them. So, set this up. We found the line that I call synchronous events. Okay. Now, what we're after is, how can we go from coordinates in your reference frame to coordinates in my reference frame, and vice versa? That's what we want to be able to do. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's what we're after here. Okay, so all we know so far is that if in your reference frame x is equal to vt, then that means that x prime is equal to zero in my reference frame. We know that much. Okay. You know that I call wherever I am zero. Here's where I am in your reference frame, and I'm always calling that zero in my reference frame. So those are the same. If this happens, this happens. If this happens, this happens. If I tell you that something is at coordinate zero in my reference frame, you can easily find it in your reference frame. Right here. Okay. Let me see. 
And if you tell me that something like this happened in your reference frame, I know it's zero on my reference frame. Okay, so we know that relationship has to exist. And we just really found another relationship that has to exist. What you call uh, t equal to bx, I call t prime equal to zero. So whatever our transformation equations are, then it better makes out what you call t equal to bx, I call t prime equal to zero. If you say this is happening, I better say this is happening. If I say this is happening, you better say this is happening. If you say this is happening, I better say this is happening. If I say this is happening, you better say this is happening. That much we know. Okay. And that's all we know so far. You with me? Yeah. Okay. So that means in trying to figure out my coordinates from your coordinates, x prime, it has to have a factor of x minus vt in it. And then it could be multiplied by a bunch of other terms I don't know. So some other function that for some reason changes with velocity. We don't know. But at the very least, I know that x prime has to be 0 when x is equal to vt. Yeah, that makes sense. You with me? So whatever the transformation equation is for x, for my x coordinates, x prime, it has to satisfy that relationship. Similarly, when trying to figure out my time coordinates, it has to have a term t minus vx in here, and it could be then some other term that somehow changes with velocity. Who knows? Okay. You follow that so far? Yeah. Okay. Second thing to know. These transformation equations that we're coming up with to go from one reference frame to another should be able to transform photons as well. So if in your reference frame, a photon is, e is x equals t, right? That's a photon in your reference frame. Yeah. Good? Mm -hmm. So a photon in your reference frame, x equals t, would be x equals t, then that would correspond to a photon in my reference frame, x prime equals t prime. Here's a photon in my reference frame. Gotcha. So if some object is following a path in your reference frame, x equals t, then in my reference frame that has to be x prime equals t prime. Yeah. And similarly, if x prime equals t prime in my reference frame, then in your reference frame that has to be x equals t. That comes from the fact that the speed of light is constant. We both agree on the speed of light. Yeah. Okay. So if x equals t, x prime equals t prime. So if, if we were to replace in this equation all our t's with x's, and in this equation all our t's with x's, then our x prime has to equal t prime. If x equals t, x prime has to equal t prime. Okay. So if we take this equation, and if I set x equal to t, so we have x prime is equal to x minus vx times f of v, and over here, if we were to substitute t prime with x minus vx times g of v, equals. equals. So if, if x equals t, and we do our substitution here, then x prime has to equal t prime. If x equals t, x prime has to equal t prime. Okay. And notice that this is the same as this. Mm -hmm. Therefore, this has to be the same as this. That makes sense. So whatever weird factor we have to add on here, it's the exact same factor that we have to add on over here for these transformation equations. So whatever our transformation equations are, whatever that extra bit is, it has to be the same. Otherwise, the speed of light wouldn't be a constant. Okay, but what is that? We don't know. We're figuring this out as we go. Oh, that's what we're trying to figure yeah, out. Yeah, we're trying to come up with the transformation equations. Oh, I see. So we knew that it had to have that factor in x prime. We knew it had to have that factor in t prime. And then it could have had some other factors. And then we just really use the fact that the speed of light is the same to figure out that those other factors actually have to be the same, whatever they are. And we're saying it's going to be some function that could possibly change with velocity. Who knows? Velocity seems to change things. Because if you and I are both holding still relative to each other, then your x is my x and your t is my t. So we're guessing it's a velocity that causes things to change. Okay. Because that's the only difference between your frame and my frame, the velocity. Right? How about our acceleration? Wouldn't that have to do with it as well? No. If there's an acceleration, 
then one of us is not in an inertial reference frame. Oh. An inertial reference frame is a non-accelerating reference frame. So we're assuming that you're in an inertial reference frame, so you're not accelerating. Okay. I'm moving at a constant velocity relative to you. Therefore, I'm not accelerating. So velocity has to be constant? Yeah, so the velocity is a constant. Okay. We're setting up a simple picture here where we're both in inertial reference frames. No one's accelerating. Accelerations make things a lot more complicated in a hurry. Yeah, that makes sense. Good so far? Any other questions? What if you're accelerating at the same rate? You can still uh, determine a difference. Remember when we talked about a person taped to the back of the train? It doesn't matter if the train's accelerating forward at a constant acceleration, it still creates a backwards force. What if yours accelerating at the same rate as someone is running behind it? Try juggling while you accelerate forward. Okay. It doesn't work. Your balls are suddenly going to be moving that way for some magical reason. Mm -hmm. Which means you have an acceleration without a force. And so it breaks Newton's equation, F equals MA. F equals MA only holds in inertial reference frames. Okay. True? Yes. <laughs> Newton's first law, roughly stated, is... There are inertial reference frames. Newton's second law, roughly stated, is an inertial reference frame F equals MA. That's roughly how you can uh, summarize those. What's up? We need, we need to borrow a six foot table from the hand of the left. Borrow a what? A six foot table. Oh, yeah, take what you need. Thank you. Okay. Now, we need to take into uh, account that there's no preferred reference frame. The only difference between your reference frame and my reference frame is the direction of the speed. In your reference frame, I'm moving with a, vo a positive velocity. Yeah. In my reference frame, you're moving with a negative velocity. That's the only difference between our reference frames. And remember, we already agreed beforehand that we're going to call that way positive and that way negative. Yeah. You're saying the only difference between velocities is negative and positive? So the absolute value of the velocities is the same? Yeah. If I'm, so if I'm sitting here in a train and I'm moving this way at a constant velocity, 2 meters per second this way, then for my reference frame, it looks like you're moving 2 meters per second that way. Yeah, that makes sense. That's the only difference between our reference frames. In your reference frame, you say I have a positive velocity that way of two meters per second. In my reference frame, I say no, you have a negative velocity of that way at two meters per second. Okay. That's the only difference between our reference frames. Mm -hmm. And so whatever our transformation law is, in going from x prime and t prime, we would expect going from x and t that it would be the same thing but switch the sign of the velocities. So whatever we do to go from your coordinates to my coordinates, it's going to be the exact same thing that we do to go from my coordinates to your coordinates. The only difference is where I was traveling with v, you're traveling with negative v. Same thing we had over here. And also the only difference in going from here to here is the sign on the beads. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's the same symmetry. So because of that symmetry, going from here to here, you're just changing the signs on the beads. And if we're going from here to here, you're just changing the signs on the beads. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. All right. So now let's figure out this f of v thing. So I'm going to start with Let's put those above, and then I'll just rewrite as I need. So I'm going to have x is equal to, I don't know that I need that. We'll just figure it out. It's hard to follow the math on small paper. 
So I'm going to rewrite out, uh, I mean, to plot x in terms of primes. So I'm going to rewrite this equation. Oh, wait, no, I'm going to rewrite this equation. So x is equal to this equation. Okay. But I'm going to substitute x prime with this and t prime with this. Okay. So x is equal to, we have x prime, which is x minus vt x prime plus v times t prime, which is t minus vx. And then we had times f of v and times f of v again. So times all times f of v squared. Yeah, that makes sense. So you follow that? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you need a cubic? No. So we already have one f of v, mm -hmm. just to rewrite the equation. And then both these terms had an f of b in it, so factor out that f of b. Oh, mm -hmm. Follow that? Okay, and now this is equal to, we'll see what happens here. Uh, maybe I want to keep doing as many lines as we go. So x is equal to, when we multiply this whole thing out, we're going to get x minus v squared. x minus vt plus vtx. Yeah. Or vt, and then minus v squared x. Right? Yep. So the minus vt and the vt cancel out. Yeah. And so we get, and I'll factor the x out of the remaining terms. So we get x is equal to x times 1 minus v squared times f of v squared. So now your t's are completely out. Yeah. I'm solving for f of v now. So I'm going to divide this side by this. So I get f of v squared is equal to, the x's are going to cancel when I take this and divide by this. It's going to be 1 over 1 minus v squared. Right? Mm -hmm. Take the square root of both sides. And we get f of v is equal to 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared. But that, can you write that out somehow? Huh? Just take the square root of both sides. I know, but can you simplify that? No, that's as simple as it gets. Okay. Okay, so now we figured out our f of v. So erase all this. And so now we can fit, we have our uh, transformation equations. And so x prime is equal to x minus vt all over the square root of 1 minus v squared. Similarly, t prime is equal to t minus vx all over the square root of 1 minus v squared. Similarly, x is equal to x prime plus v t prime, all over the square root of 1 minus v squared, and t, t is equal to uh, t prime plus v x prime, all over the square root of 1 minus v squared. Now these are the Lorentz transformations. Typically we just write the two prime equations, don't bother with these because they only differ from that by sign. But these are called the Lorentz transformations. And that's how you transfer from one coordinate system to another coordinate system. Go ahead. This only applies when x is equal to t, right? No. This applies in any reference frame. This applies for any two reference frames varying by some velocity v. Now, notice that we kept everything in terms of units of the speed of light. So I'm going to plug the speed of light back into this equation, and then we'll ignore it as we continue further on. Okay. But just to plug the speed of light back in here. So the way that we do that for x prime, x prime would be equal to, and the, the, the thing to see is check the units. Because when we replace the speed of light with a 1, the speed of light was still 1 meters per second. Right? Mm -hmm. And so in all these maths, we had these weird meters per seconds hanging around that we didn't bother writing out because we didn't write the units of everything. So we have hanging units in there. To figure out where the speed of light goes, just fix your units. 
Basically. Yeah, that's all you really need to do is make it dimensionally consistent again. So x is a position, right? Mm -hmm. Velocity times time is a position. So this right here is still just a position, a displacement. And it's meters. Down here we have 1 minus a speed squared. Uh-oh, the units in the denominator are screwed up. So this is actually x minus vt, if we plug c back in, it would be over the square root of 1 minus v over c squared, or v squared over c squared, maybe right like that. And now you have a speed divided by speed is unitless. Yeah. All right, so you have meters and meters now. Mm -hmm. So that's where it would have gone back in there. Let me write that just a little bit bigger. 1 minus v squared over c squared, square root. Similarly, t prime now is equal to, the denominator we're going to have the same problem. So it's 1 minus v squared over c squared. The numerator, t is a time, that's a time, so we still have t prime. V is meters per second. Don't you just want it to be T? And not X T is meters. We need to make it a T. We need to make it a time. We need to make it seconds. So divide it by C. C squared. C squared. Yeah, because we need to multiply. We need meters squared over seconds squared to multiply out to get just seconds. So this is going to be minus v over c squared times t. Next, go ahead. Uh, you have a t prime on the other side. Is that for a reason? No, that's a typo. Thank you. Maybe one of the two different equations with boxes around them. So these are the, the wrench transformations. If you Google the wrench transformations, you get those two equations. The wrench. Is it supposed to be times Lord. x? T minus v over c squared times x? Or do I have that wrong? Am I confused? On the units? No, okay. you are not. I don't know why I put the t there, because you have meters, meters per second, and then seconds over meters. Okay, thank you. Because I fix everything. Let's get rid of those. Let me get rid of all the starvation stuff. So now notice what our Lorentz transformations used to be. Or not our Lorentz transformations. Notice what we thought the transformations were when we naively thought about the world. We thought it was x prime equals negative, or sorry, right here. x prime equals x minus vt. So here's what we thought it was. We thought it was x prime equals x minus vt. When in reality it's x prime is equal to x minus vt all over 1 minus v squared over c squared. Now let's imagine that you are traveling at 1 million, sorry, let's keep it simple, 3 million meters per second. Or in other words, 1% the speed of light. Okay. That's an absurdly fast speed. Yeah. Well, let's look at this denominator here. So then you get 1 minus 1% the speed of light. When you square that, that's going to be 0. 0.0001 divided by the speed of light squared which is going to be 3 times 10 to the 16. Take a really small number, divide it by a massive number, which makes it absurdly small, yeah. and then do 1 minus it, and what do you get? Just 1. Basically 1. So this denominator, even when you're going really fast, is basically just 1. And so you're basically just left with x prime is equal to x minus vt. So Which is, is why that's how Galileo thinks the world works. He thought it worked like this. Einstein says, no, it's actually like this. It's just, you don't deal with speeds that make a difference. Mm -hmm. It's only at really, really high speeds that this difference becomes noticeable. Why is that relevant? Why, why is that relevant? Why not just use Galileo's stuff? Oh, because sometimes you are working with high speed things. Really? Yeah, I mean, we talked about 0.1% the speed of light, but now we're talking about 0.9 the speed of light. So going back in terms of units of c, that's just going to be 1 minus 0.9 the speed of light squared. So if you're going 0.9 the speed of light, 1 minus 0.9 the speed of light squared, that's now equal to 1 minus 0.81, which is equal to 0.2 or 0.19, which is very different from 1. Now it makes a huge difference. I see. 
Okay, that makes sense. So the point is, this is a great approximation at low speeds, at low speeds, whatever a low speed is. If your speed's much less than the speed of light, we're good. Yeah. <laughs> Similarly, let's look at this one. Galileo said T prime is equal to T. Time is time. So thought Galileo. Well, we already talked about how the denominator is almost always one, mm -hmm. right? The numerator, notice that it has a B over C squared term. Mm -hmm. If B is small compared to the speed of light, that's stupid small. Basically nothing. It's basically nothing. And then zero times something is just zero. Right. Gotcha. So it becomes basically these equations. So those equations are good approximations. Uh, there's a reason that Galileo and Newton thought that those were the equations. There's a reason that it took an Einstein to say, no, they're not the equations. Different Einstein? Yeah. Well, Lorentz is the one who first realized these equations, but he was just having fun with mathematical equations. <laughs> he didn't think that this was physically what was going on in the real world. So he knew about this. He was playing around with transformations that would preserve the speed of light, and he came up with these. But he did not think that this was real about how the world was operating. He thought it was a cute trick he found. Einstein was the one that says, nope, that's describing reality. And this is just a teeny part of what he did. We're just getting our foot in the door. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that's the, the Lorentz transformations. So now, uh, maybe make a side note. So far, we've just been talking about one dimension of uh, space. We've just been talking about the x direction. And all our motion has been confined to the x-direction. Right? If all your velocity is in the x-direction, here's how you convert to my x-coordinate from your x-coordinate. But what about my y-coordinate and my z-coordinate? Turns out those don't change. Yeah, they would just be So y prime is still just y, and z prime is still just z. If all our motion is along the x-direction. Then it's not. Well, in this case, we're saying it up so it is. We're going to keep it to cases where all the motion's along the x direction. Well, that happens when it's not just in the x direction. Then you have to start using the Pythagorean theorem. Okay. Okay. So, it only has the effect in the direction of motion. All right. So, now let's talk about space contractions and then time contractions. Space contractions and time contractions, which essentially mean, uh, if you call something a meter, what do I call it? What do I measure it, it as? Meter. And when you measure it as the same thing? No. And let me try and make it make sense to your intuition how measuring is actually tied to simultaneity. If you and I can't agree about what simultaneous events are, then we might not be able to agree about how to measure something. So let's be real careful about what we mean by the length of something. Okay. So notice that, let's say that I were trying to measure a train. And I come and I start by measuring stick at the very end of the train, but the train's moving that way. So I start at the end of the train, and then I go down another one, and I go down another one. Well, since the train was moving forward as I'm measuring it, I'm going to measure it to be longer than it actually is. Yeah. Right? Okay. Or if I start measuring a train, and the instant I start measuring it, it starts moving that way. If I keep measuring by the time I get to the end, I'm going to measure it to be shorter than it actually is. Wouldn't you just have to move at the same speed as the train? You start on the same space. If you go this much of the train, and then you just put the end right there and do this much of the train, and then you do this much of the train, and then how fast it's going. Let's think about another way that we could say it. In your reference frame, you're watching a train drive by. You're in the holding still reference frame. You're watching the train drive by, and it goes through a tunnel. And you see that at the very instant the front of the train comes out of the tunnel is the exact instant that the back of the train completely went into the tunnel. Okay. So from your perspective, the train entering and exiting the tunnel was a simultaneous event. And therefore, you conclude the train is as long as the tunnel. That makes sense. That's roughly what you're doing in measuring. When you hold something up, you say at a simultaneous instant, 
One end was here and another end was here. And so it's this long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, gotcha. Right? Now, if you and I can't agree about what a simultaneous instant is, then now we run into trouble about what we mean by measuring something. So how do you convert between the measurements? No, you still measure. This is how we'll transform between your coordinates and my coordinates. Oh. That's what you do when I set my coordinate system. I'm saying, here's my measurements. When you set a coordinate system, you're saying, here's your measurements. And we already know that you and I have different coordinate systems. Yeah. Something funky is going on. We do not agree about coordinates. But the distance is going to be the same. But the distance is going to be the same. We'll see. We don't have to guess. We don't just have to sit here and think about it and speculate about the universe. We can just uh, do the math. Okay. Right? Okay. Are you afraid of what the math is going to show? I don't know. All right. I don't know what it shows. It shows some pretty weird stuff. So let's uh, set up the picture I want to use. So here's this. Here's me moving in your reference frame. So this is x equals vt, or in other words, x prime equals zero as I'm moving through your reference frame. And then here's what I call instantaneous events, simultaneous events. You call this t equals bx. I call this t prime equals zero. With me so far? Not very symmetric, but hopefully you get the picture. Okay. Okay. Now, here in your reference frame, we'll drag it down some. Here in your reference frame is what you call x equals to 1. In other words, this distance you call all the way up 1 meter. Okay. So what does that meter now look like in my reference frame? If I'm going to measure that meter stick, I need to measure this front and the end at simultaneous times. Yeah, that makes sense. Right? And so I am going to say that it's whatever the distance is from here to here, because this is simultaneous for me. That makes the distance shorter, though. Why does it Shorter? I mean, it makes longer. your... Longer. Which one's shorter? This one or this one? The bottom one. The bottom one, sorry. This is a right angle. Yeah. A squared plus b squared. Alright. Why? Uh, What's that? Why? How come you can do that? Why do you get to just stretch grass to make new money? <laughs> I'm not sure I understand the question. No golf point here. I'm just setting up some things in your reference frame. In your reference frame, here I go. Woo! We already calculated what I call time equals zero. There it is. Here's what you call one meter. I measure the same distance, but at my simultaneous events. So here's what I may call one of your meters. So you're holding your meter stick, I'm swinging by, and I'm going to measure it. And since you're moving relative to me, we have to be careful that I measure the start and the end at the same time. I don't want it moving while I measure it, otherwise that's going to throw off my measurement. Yeah. So I need to capture its length at one instant in time. Okay. So I need to look at where its start and its end are simultaneously at the same instant. So its start is here and its end is here at the same instant in time in my reference frame. Because you're just holding your meter stick. So your meter stick is just staying here forever. Here's the end of the meter stick forever. I'm coming past you so I know where the start is. I need to figure out where the end of the meter stick is in my reference frame at a simultaneous event at time equals zero in my reference frame. Yeah. You see that? Yeah, I know what you're saying. Is there something weird about it? Your graph is weird. Because a meter is a meter. <laughs> 
there's a meter in your reference frame, I need to measure its start and end at a simultaneous event in my reference frame. Because relative to me, the meter's moving. If you're holding the meter stick still, I'm moving past it. Right? Yeah. I'm slowly moving along here. I need to measure your meter stick as I'm moving along. And so if I don't want to screw up my length, I need to do it at a simultaneous event. Okay. Okay. So, whatever the coordinate is, the x coordinate is in my frame, is what we're interested in here. How long is it in my frame? Because we already know what it is in your frame. So we're looking for the x coordinate of A in my frame, prime. Because we already know it's what I call t prime equal to zero. So just to help with intuition really quick, let's just really quick scratch this picture from my reference frame. From my reference frame, here's you. Here's what you call simultaneous events. Here's your time equals zero. And your meter stick is moving like this in my reference frame. Why? That's the end of your meter stick. The end of my meter stick? Yeah. I don't need to connect it to that line down there if you don't want. Here's you. Here's the end of your meter stick in your reference frame. Okay. You see that? Yeah. So I need to measure this distance right here. Yeah. Which, converting back to this frame, is this distance right here. Here's the point A. If we want to label this point, that's point B, that's right here. That's converting from you, from yours to mine. So this distance is this distance, is the same as just my x prime coordinate there. Because my t prime coordinate there is zero. Jesus, where's the right angle? Right here. But that's not a right angle. That's not a right angle. <laughs> no, it's a right angle in your reference ring, not necessarily in mine. We do not necessarily agree about that. Oh, that makes sense. <laughs> doesn't make a lot of sense okay but here's a picture of my reference frame here it is in your reference frame right hopefully what does make sense is how the point from here to a is the same as this and that's just the x coordinate here in my reference frame if that has x coordinate x prime at a that's just going to be the distance here but the angle's different. forget angles for a second here just accept, if you can just accept that, this to this, is in, that's how it looks in my reference frame. Then you see how the x prime coordinate of A is the length of the meter. That's the part I want you to see. Is the bottom part from A to B the same size as it's on that both reference frames? Is from here to here the same as here to here? Yeah. Uh, I'm not positive. I'd have to plug them in and see. So you should draw as a right angle from... Angles are not preserved going from here to here necessarily. And distances are not preserved going from here to here necessarily. But you said, but that's the same distance. Is the distance from the origin to A and the origin to A. Okay. Let's continue with this and then I think we'll have our, that doesn't make sense, but I get what you're saying now, conversation. Okay. Okay. So we're looking for what x coordinate I assign to that point, right? Mm -hmm. And that's going to be its length. And we can use our Lorentz transformation. How do we get it from yours? Take what it is in yours and plug it in. And that's how we get it in mine. So in mine, you're saying that it's at x coordinate 1, mm -hmm. right? So over here, what you call x coordinate 1, oh, sorry. So your x coordinate is 1 minus v times the time coordinate that you give it is vx, yes. which is v times 1 again. Okay. You, you see how I'm just plugging into this? Yeah, I see. All over the square root of 1 minus v squared. So now, in case you don't see it, this is 1 minus v squared all over the square root of 1 minus v squared. square root of 1 minus v squared. 
Now, since we don't have C in here, we're going to drop C's, but that means our velocities are always going to be really, really small numbers because we're doing our velocities in units of the speed of light. Yeah. Okay, so this is 1 minus a really small number squared, right? Which is just basically 1. It's going to be slightly less than 1. You see that? Yeah. So it's slightly less than 1. That means when you're holding this meter stick, as I measure as I go by, I measure it to be slightly less than one meter. Which means, weird part, this distance is smaller than this distance. Wait, so I was right? No, that's not how right angles work. We cannot use Euclidean geometry. No. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot let the fact that we're drawing this on a flat plane throw you off. Our notion, we cannot use Euclidean geometry here. This is not Euclidean space. Euclidean geometry does not work. The top is smaller. This distance right here, the length of this, is smaller than the length of this. Well, in your, your reference frame, that's obvious. Yeah. In the bottom one. In the bottom one, that makes sense. So that's what the right angle would be. Yeah. So as I go by, your meter sticks look a little bit short to me. And the faster I go by, the shorter your meter sticks look. In other words, if I were traveling this way at really, really high speeds, and I looked over at you guys, you guys would all look really squished to up. What? You'd look your same height, but you'd be really thin. You'd be contracted this way. If you were running? If I was moving this way at a very high speed, and I look over at you guys, you guys all look like you're contracted. The room looks contracted. Everything looks contracted. To me. Yeah, to you. What you call meter, what you call one, I call less than one. And at really high speeds, what you end up calling a meter could end up looking like a centimeter to me. And so if I'm going at high enough speed, that whole desk looks like it's two centimeters long. Similarly, as I'm going past you, to you, I look really skinny. Would you look bigger? No. It's the same exact problem. From So, if I'm going this way really fast, then you look contracted to me. But for my reference frame, you're the one going that way really fast. So I look contracted to you. Oh, so we look contracted to each other. Yeah. And if we got to the point where V was 1, or in other words, we were traveling the speed of light, then what do lengths look like? Nothing. They don't look like anything. So photons do not, from a photon's perspective, it does not travel a distance. Weird, right? Photons don't travel distances? From their perspective, from their reference frame. From their reference frame? From their reference frame. You have a whole new reference frame. Okay. Now we could work this out from reverse. We could have instead changed the picture. We could have done this picture. We could have said, I call this one. What do you call this distance right here? It's the same algebra. You would have also came up with 1 minus v squared. So it's the same for both of us. Even though it looks bigger. bigger. If you call something, yes. That's bigger. This length is the same as this length. Why? No, that's origin to B. That's origin to A. <laughs> Sorry. How can I say this correctly? This down here is my reference frame. Right? What a one meter to me looks like in your reference frame. It is the same as what one, one meter to you looks like in my reference frame. Looks like, but that doesn't change what it is. What do you mean, what it is? <laughs> you can only say something is what you measure it to be. When I measure it, precisely, I will measure it to be slightly less than a meter. I will use one of my meter sticks, and I will measure one of your meter sticks, and I will measure it to be a little bit short. Similarly, here I am going by with my music, you have yours. 
as I'm going by, you'll use your meter stick to measure my meter stick, and you'll measure my meter stick to be a little bit short. And so we'll both say to each other, you have a short meter stick. No. Okay, let's try it this way. Let's get your x for mine. So let's say the x that you find, if I say it's at one meter, right? Okay. So if x prime is one, so how do we get x from x prime? We're using this equation. So x prime is one plus v uh, t prime for me. How can I say this? What you call t equal to zero, I call t prime equal to minus vx, right? Okay. So, we're getting your coordinates from mine. Okay. X prime. Sorry. Right? So that's the same as what you call times zero. I call t prime equal to minus vx prime. So, getting your x coordinate from my x coordinates, that's x prime. I'm just holding one meter, so my x prime is one. Plus v times t prime. T prime is V times X prime minus V times X prime. Where X prime is one. But X prime is one. So that's a one. And then this is all over the square root of one minus V squared. And so you get one minus V squared over one minus V squared. So you're going to get that it equals the square root of one minus V squared. Same Slightly thing. shorter. That's what I meant. That's what I was trying to say by we'll measure it the same. Okay, what about time contractions? Time contractions now. What you call a second versus what I call a second. <laughs> <laughs> so here's your x-axis, here's your t-axis. And you pick some time t equal to one. So here's what you call one second, right? Mm -hmm. Over here, what do I call one second? For me, it's going to be the length of whatever this is in my reference range, if we stretch it out. And it's that supposed so to be So it's going to be my t prime coordinate. So how do we get my t prime coordinate from your coordinates? So t prime is equal to your coordinate t, which is 1, right? Looking at this one. Minus v times the x position. My x position in your reference frame is just vt. So it's just v? v times t1, which, yeah. And once again, the denominator is 1 minus v squared. And so once again, you get 1 minus v squared over 1 minus v. And so you get, once again, square root of 1 minus v squared. And then vice versa. And then vice versa. Okay. So similarly, if you were watching a tick watch that I'm holding, a watch that I'm holding, a stopwatch, and you have a stopwatch, and we synchronize our stopwatches right as I pass you. So you're standing right here. I'm sticking out my arm, something, I don't know. Right as I pass you, we synchronize our watches. Okay. Now both our watches are running. When you, after your watch has gone a second, if you look at my watch, it's going to say slightly less than a second. Similarly, as I'm going by, if I look at my watch, once it says one second, if I look at your watch, it's going to say slightly less than one second. How does that work, though? Like, if you're watching each other's watches, then... It takes time for light to travel. Okay, so a second to me is not necessarily a second to you. And so this distance is less than this distance. And this is the origin of what is called the twin paradox. The twin paradox. 
the twin paradox. So how does the twin paradox work? The twin paradox says, you take two twins, and one twin, you send off on a trip where they travel out at a high velocity for a long time, and then they travel back at a high velocity for a long time. Okay. You, on the other hand, just stand here. Since this distance is less than this distance, and this distance is less than this distance, and you've aged more. the age, the twin, has aged less than you. Or you've aged more. Weird. And this can, like, actually happen? Like, this is and possible. this can, like, actually happen. Now, you might be tempted to say, whoa, whoa, whoa. What about from the twin's perspective? From the twins' perspective, wasn't it that you went away, then you came back? Yeah. Here's the difference. Your velocity never changed in this. The twin was the one who was actually accelerated. And we know which one was accelerated. So now it has and to so it's not, changes. you can't argue that, well, since this happened this way, then from the twins' perspective, you should have been the one to age less. Because... Only one of you was actually accelerated at this point. And this is one of the ways that people try to disprove Einstein's theory of relativity using this exact confusion. So when you throw in the accelerations, then... It blows the picture up. And you can no longer use what's called special relativity. Well, you can, but you can no longer use this simple stuff that we're talking about anymore. Accelerations make everything complex. So notice that in order for the twin to go out, then turn around and come back, that twin had to experience an acceleration. Yeah. Okay. So, you and the twin do not both have inertial reference frames. Only your frame is an inertial reference frame. Theirs was inertial, then they got a bunch of acceleration, and then it was inertial again. I see. Okay. So, that's the origins of the twin paradox. Once again, notice what happens to the time of the moving observer relative to you as they're traveling at really, really high speeds. The faster I go, the more my clock slows down relative to you. What happens if I travel at the speed of light? When you not know time You don't time. experience time. And so from our reference frame, or from a photon's reference frame, a photon does not experience distances, and a photon does not experience time. It just... So if I were to take you into a spaceship, and have you travel around the universe a hundred times at the speed of light and come back, you would have no memory of the trip. You would have gotten on and stepped off, and that would have been the whole trip. Wouldn't, and the world wouldn't have like done anything, right? Oh, the world would have changed a lot. If you were on a thousand year trip, the world would be a thousand years older, you would have aged a second. <laughs> okay. All right, so we got length contractions and time contractions. <laughs> so we've shown that lengths are relative, and we've shown that time intervals are relative. Well, is just everything relative? Yeah. No. Except speed. No. There are invariants. Everything in physics, it's not all relative. There are invariants. It just turns out, talking about someone's, talking about distances in space and distances in time is a lot like talking about coordinates that people use. And so if I have my coordinate system set up this way, and you have your coordinate system set up this way, and we describe the coordinates of this point, we're going to assign it different coordinates. That's still the same point. But it's still the same point, and there are invariant properties. Namely, the distance this point is from the origin is an invariant property in Euclidean geometry, no matter how you rotate. Well, what about it turns out what we're doing is a rotation in hyperbolic geometry, and there are still invariants in hyperbolic geometry. And so we'll talk about that next time. And now that you got what is relative, we'll get you what's not relative and what's absolute.